we launched our institute just a year ago. It's housed in a collaboration between Sydney Local Health District and the University of Sydney in the beautiful Charles Perkins Centre. Um, this was our launch with our fearless leader, Teresa, um, Minister Hunt, Minister Davies, um, our then um, New South Wales Minister for Mental Health, also launched it along with um, Steve Simpson and, and um, the Vice-Chancellor and our beautiful Ambassador Yana Pittman, who's done an awful... She's the first um, person with a public profile actually to go on the record in terms of having an eating disorder, and that's been a journey to watch um, the work that she's been able to do just by simply um, being brave enough to speak up about her experiences with a pretty severe eating disorder for quite a long period of time while she was an Olympic athlete competing for our country. Um, just a few facts about eating disorders for those that don't know. About 1 in 20 people in Australia have an eating disorder at the moment. 1,900 people are expected to develop anorexia nervosa, the most severe um, of the eating disorders in terms of mortality and usually in terms of medical morbidity as well. Um, many more people will develop bulimia nervosa and binge eating disorder and the other eating disorders that are clinically debilitating. Um, men, um, eating disorders in men are significantly underdiagnosed, under-researched and every sort of activity under-treated that you would expect following on from that. Um, about 450 Australians will die um, of anorexia nervosa this year. Um, one in five of these deaths is expected to be by suicide. Eating disorders have a very high suicide attempt rate and a reasonably high completion rate. And about 200 people in Australia will die from bulimia nervosa this year as well. So eating disorders have one of the highest mortality rates among the mental illnesses. That has been sort of demonstrated in a number of um, meta-analysis type um, papers over the last 15, 10, 15 years, and it's been repeatedly shown. And I think that's been a bit of a surprise to a lot of people. It's certainly been one of the levers um, with which we've been able to convince government and convince health service agencies and convince universities and research agencies that eating disorders need to be a priority for funding, um, for investment, for research and for clinical innovation. Um, and the reason we launched Inside Out just a year ago is that there was no body in Australia representing research and clinical excellence in eating disorders. It was the only major mental diagnostic um, illness without such an institute. All the others have at least one. Some have several. And so without that point of leadership, we really couldn't ex ex expect to transform the investment into this field, both cl clinically and from a research point of view. So our mission is very... Our vision is very simple, to provide every person with an eating disorder access to the best possible care, to transform the treatment landscape and ultimately find the cure. It's probably not the right phrase, um, but the factors that can lead to cure um, through an enduring path of inquiry. And obviously we take our values of transformation, excellence, respect, integrity, courage and compassion very seriously. We have four pillars of work across um, which we try to achieve, research and translation, clinical innovation. Um, what do we mean by that? We really just mean how do we turn that sort of research and translation knowledge into something that can make a difference at the front line for people that have these illnesses, their families and carers. We do a lot of workforce development and training across New South Wales and nationally. And then an, another big part of our work is really in the space of public policy and, and health system reform. And today I'm just going to overview a couple of the, the big projects that we've got off the ground um, since we launched a year ago. Um, so we've managed to raise in our first year um, just over $20 million in research, service development um, and strategic funding. Just over four million of that in competitive research grants from NH and MRC and others. Twelve million from New South Wales state government for health system reform in this state for eating disorders. Four million for strategic reform work at the federal level, and just under half a million from philanthropic sources. So I'll overview three of our big projects for you, so you can get a um, an insight into the type of work that we're doing and the type of change that we're trying to drive. So this is the New South Wales Service Plan for People with Eating Disorders. Inside Out brought together the work of a number of people that were working across the University of Sydney, Sydney LHD, New South Wales Ministry of Health. So this project precedes our launch, but was led by myself and a number of others and now falls under the umbrella of our organisation. Um, the, the, this was the first service plan for eating disorders, the first policy 
of any kind actually for eating disorders in New South Wales. Prior to 2013, there wasn't any policy directive at the ministry level about eating disorders. What did that mean? Uh, I'll tell you in, in the next slide, but basically it meant that people really weren't treated very consistently, if at all. So it was announced by Minister Skinner in 2013. It's um, very end of 2013. It really spanned 2014 to 2018. We've just completed delivery of that plan. It had a sort of coordination and statewide additional funds of 17.6 million over those five years. We're very fortunate that Minister Davies, just before she stepped down as Mental Health Minister in New South Wales, secured the second phase of implementation for that very broad strategic reform and increased the funding envelope um, for the coordination aspect across the state. And what is the plan? It is essentially a policy directive to the public health system in New South Wales saying that eating disorders form part of the core business of health services in New South Wales. And why was that needed? Well, prior to 2013, the situation was that, that they weren't part of the core business of the health system. It was, it was optional as to whether you provided treatment, essentially, to a person with an eating disorder or not in any public facility in New South Wales. Now, that's a little bit of an overstatement of the case, but in reality, that was what we were up against. We were routinely told it's not part of our business, it's not part of our service planning models, therefore we don't need to provide service to these clients. So severely ill adults with anorexia nervosa were routinely turned away from emergency departments all across the state. They were not admitted to hospital even when profoundly unwell. 67% um, of the community mental health teams that we audited in 2013 refused to see eating disorders. Um, there are a number of reasons, but a lot of them said that it's just simply not a mental illness, so we won't be providing treatment to these clients. There was no treatment for bulimia nervosa or binge eating disorder, which are about 4% of the population almost anywhere in the public system, perhaps excepting if you had very severe medical complications associated with bulimia nervosa and you managed to get a hospital bed. Um, in all of our um, surveys of health staff, they felt unwilling um, often to treat these clients, and the biggest reason given for that was that they felt very unskilled in the area. So there was an urgent need for reform for this illness group. Just to give you an idea of the scale of the reform, you all are probably familiar with the districts, um, the health districts of New South Wales, and, and we had a whole of health system reform involving every district, every hospital, every community um, <laughs> mental health team, and these are our hospitals throughout New South Wales. And when the plan was announced, it was really myself and some admin support put as the lead of that implementation, but we managed to get um, the means to support the funding of a coordinator in every local health district to work with executives and service providers to change that treatment landscape. The targets of the reform in New South Wales are that eating disorders become part of the routine core business of every local health district. It's a whole of health concern involving mental health and medical health, and that poses a real challenge to the health system for those two sides, those two sectors to come together and deliver integrated care, and we're still very much working on that. That is a very big target for stage two. We needed, at first, um, in stage one, to open emergency department pathways, ensure the critically unwell were being admitted to hospital, train general hospital staff, develop hospital treatment in medical wards and mental health wards to save lives, uh, educate our community clinicians in evidence-based treatments and increase treatment in the community so that we could intervene earlier. That's a very broad brushstroke of that um, of that um, project that we're working on. And as I said, we're moving into stage two now. Um, we've achieved much in stage one. We have managed to um, open most emergency department pathways in New South Wales. Very unwell um, people are being routinely admitted to hospital, both in paediatric wards and adult wards across the state. We've trained 1,600 uh, 1, uh, community clinicians from mental health teams in New South Wales in the two evidence-based treatments for eating disorders, FBT and CBT. Um, and we are starting to see an increase in treatment in the community. I'm not presenting our data today from this, although we do have it, um, demonstrating all of this, because I wanted to overview a few of our other projects and the work we're undertaking. Um, we've been very fortunate to receive um, funding from the federal government to lead a national research and translation strategy for eating disorders. Um, eating disorders have one of the lowest research dollar spends among the mental illnesses, not surprisingly, given um, 
the lack of attention they've received in a number of areas. The research dollar spend equates to about $1 per affected individual as compared to $167 for the depressive illnesses, over $70 for schizophrenia, autism, etc. So it's extremely underfunded. And what does that mean? It means there's not much innovation. It means there's not much clinical um, improvement in clinical care. We have been doing the same things for a long time. It also means that most people with eating disorders do not receive evidence-based care. And given that we've got an illness group that has one of the highest mortality rates among the mental illnesses, but is also curable, and you can't say that about um, every group of mental illnesses, but anorexia nervosa, if you receive the right treatment at the right time, has a reasonably higher success rate in terms of full remission, and bulimia nervosa has an even higher um, remission rate if you receive the right treatment at the right time, and yet we've got one of the highest mortality rates. So this is unacceptable as far as I'm concerned, and, and if we do enough, we can change this in the next 10 years. So there is an absolute imperative to drive evidence into practice, um, which has just not been happening as, um, as a downstream effect of the lack of investment in research, I would argue. So we've initially got four million over four years. The first thing is to develop this research and translation strategy. We've conducted nationwide consultation in every state and jurisdiction, trying to get agreement as, what, as to what are the research targets, what are the targets for barriers to translation that need funding, and what are the targets for barriers to implementation of evidence that need funding. And part of this $4 million will support structural supports for evidence gathering and implementation. Very basic things like data capture at the point of care, which is taken for granted in other illness groups um, across medical and mental health. We don't have any of those sorts of basic structures um, for this illness group. So that's a very big project and moving along nicely. And then very recently, we were very lucky to receive $3.6 million over five years from the Million Minds Research Mission through the NH and MRC to create the first <coughs> National Centre for Health System Research in Eating Disorders. And we're going to need to build on that investment from other sources to certainly expand the program over time. Our partners are the Brain Mind Centre at the University of Sydney, the Centre for Excellence in Eating Disorders in Victoria, Queensland Centre for Excellence in Eating Disorders, the Charles Perkins Centre where we're housed. And what we're trying to tackle with this project is that there is very little information about eating disorders in the health system. They haven't been treated routinely, they have not been part of core business, they have not been diagnosed or recorded as diagnostic categories in our um, recording systems. Um, we don't really know about detection rates, we don't really know about what people receive and we don't really know about outcomes. So pretty basic sort of knowledge gaps that we need to address. Um, as of November, and, and our institute was involved in this, the federal government is going to enhance the Medicare sessions to eating disorders to up from 10 um, psychological sessions up to 40 psychological sessions per year rebated by Medicare and from five dietetic up to 20 dietetic. There are going to be restrictions on who can access those but it is the single biggest clinical investment by far in this illness group and probably the largest we're likely to, to see for a very long time. It's brilliant um, that the federal government have made access to community evidence-based care for people with eating disorders, not hospital end of the line emergency intervention so broadly available, but obviously the imperative to drive evidence into practice for those 40 sessions is very, very high. And we need to track what goes on once those sessions become available and are delivered by clinicians who perhaps are not expert um, in treating this illness group. So we're going to establish a national surveillance system. We've got um, the data custodians of the Medicare data set, the national GP data set, national headspace data set and all state health departments and we're going to link across all of those um, health data sets to try to work out how many people are being detected across the system, what sort of intervention is being delivered and what are the outcomes from those interventions. And then if we can develop a dashboard that we can communicate these sorts of very important health outcomes, we can drive change across the system. Because um, the only bit of data that we're really missing from linking across those existing health data sets is the experience of the person who is going through the illness, their families and carers. And they're probably the best to identify the gaps in the system and identify um, 
the inconsistencies and where we could improve. So we're also launching a national lived experience survey and we will be able to link that data across our national data sets as well to better drive um, information about where we can improve. We're going to have health economic models costing these um, and then later in the program based on the data that we collect and the findings, we can um, implement some screening and early intervention pilots in mainstream health settings, specifically Headspace and PHNs. So that is a very, very quick overview of the work that our National Institute, the first National Institute for Eating Disorders, is trying to achieve. These are our current uh, sort of other research trials that we've got going on. Um, thank you very much for listening.